Howdy, I'm Jacob here. Today we're doing a one-off on the company Burberry Group. They are in the textile, apparel, and luxury goods industry. 4.7 billion market cap on 4.5 billion enterprise value. They manufacture, retail, and wholesale luxury goods under the Burberry brand. And they operate essentially globally. Founded in 1856, headquartered in the UK. So they've been around for quite some time. They're one of those luxury brands that you know, in my perspective, I don't know if the growth is going to be absolutely insane, but I mean, they already produce such a good amount of free cash flow and earnings that it, you can always have a great return without without a lot of growth if you just buy back shares and pay a dividend and just have methods of giving back money to your shareholders in the most cost effective way. So we'll see whether we think we're doing they're doing that or not. But pretty good return on invested capital. We're averaging mid-teens the growth like i expected wasn't very good i mean pretty much flat essentially flat over the last 10 years gross prof gross margin down a tad operating margin down a tad but i mean a 70 percent gross margin is pretty impressive and then a higher to mid-teen operating margin is also very impressive with dividend per share also growing um or dividend per share is growing so they're paying an earnings per share not quite as much so really they're paying more for the dividend than they were 10 years ago in a outflow perspective but um we'll see if they can afford that it looks like in the last five years they can afford it but the last year does look like it was a pretty big payout ratio balance sheet shows 560 million dollars cash on hand with 100 million short-term debt 380 million long-term debt just a whole lot of capital leases. So I presume that they just have a bunch of stores and uh, malls and such, and that requires capital leases. And that's shown in the property plan and then the capital leases. But when it actually comes to long-term and short-term debt, uh, you're going to about 480 million and they have more than that in cash on hand. So we're feeling pretty good about this balance sheet. Most things except for the growth right now are looking pretty solid. Um, Cash flow uh, for the cash flow statement, we see pretty solid cash flow production. I mean, capital expenditures are not that high. They have a whole lot of things that depreciate and amortize, so that's more than making up for their capital expenditures. We see just the last three years: four hundred twelve million, four hundred seventeen million, four hundred eighty-two million depreciation and amortization with capital expenditures of one hundred fifty-eight, one hundred twenty-six, two hundred six. Well below that, so they're producing a lot more free cash flow than earnings which i i I, pre I like better uh when a company is gushing out cash flow and you know the earnings are what you, what you pay taxes on so there's always loopholes and stuff kind of that sounds a bit bad but there's always ways to depreciate and amortize and um delay your ability to pay taxes on some of the some of the earnings power that you have but when it comes to free cash flow it's literally just money in money out and so um i love to see that their use of cash is a little bit of reinvestment into these intangibles a little bit of acquisition but i mean you're looking at a heavy heavy percentage of their free cash flow going towards dividend and share purchases that dividend currently paying out 296 million of their five-year average free cash flow is maybe 50 to 60 percent so i don't really want them increasing that too much more but if you if you buy back shares enough that aggregate payment of dividend doesn't change but as a percent of the stock price it should be going up so without even really having to increase the actual payout of your dividend if you just keep buying back shares there's going to be less people to hand out the dividend to increasing that percentage and so I mean, if it's a if it's a good buy right now, I think that might be the best use of their capital allocation. Otherwise, um, I, I didn't point this out, but they do ha have a very high return on invested capital over here. That that number does get inflated through share repurchases, and they've let, they've been around since 1860 and have been buying back shares at least in the last 10 years for sure. So that could have inflated those numbers a little bit, but. Um, I mean, mostly good things here. Let's start making some assumptions for evaluation. On the revenue growth side, okay, so 
really just flat, and that's including, well, this was a devastation in 2018. Okay, yeah, I'm not, I'm just not going to see a lot of growth here. So maybe 2, 12, and so this is saying 2% revenue growth a year over the next seven years, 12 for the terminal P at the end of seven years. I think that luxury brands have a tiny bit of an advantage when it comes to downturns due to the fact that, I mean, initially you might think people don't buy nice things, but if it's catered around the more wealthy people, they're going to be less affected by a downturn um, or a recession. So I, I don't think I'd expect too much decline um, on the revenue side and even the margin side. So pretty hefty difference here. Maybe let's do let's do 12 and 15 percent with a share change. They have been buying back quite a bit of shares. One percent would be about 470. Or ten percent would be holy smoke. One percent would be about forty-seven million. So maybe let's do five percent would be about two hundred and twenty, two hundred and thirty million. Yeah, that's a that's a good amount there. And let's do four percent. Um, on the dividend side, I mean they they can afford that just fine. 296 million. I don't want them increasing that at all, though. So, um, I guess the only thing I'd change here, I think maybe a tiny bit optimistic there on the revenue growth side and terminal P side, just because I mean, they've literally had zero percent growth in the last 10 years. So, maybe that took with only one net devastation there. So, with this, I mean. With these assumptions, we're pretty close. 13% from a buy price. So that means hopefully not too much longer until I do some, some research on this company and see whether I think that these assumptions hold or not. But, I mean, it it makes sense. They're, they're selling for a pretty reasonable P right now. Their free cash flow is so much greater than their earnings. So on a free cash flow basis, you're selling for a single digit uh, price to free cash flow. Their product, their repurchasing of shares and their dividend are really giving the money back to you as the shareholder. And so I don't know if you're going to get that compound growth that you could get on some other companies, but I do think that this could be a great investment over a five, 10 year period where, um, you know, maybe Burberry gets a little bit of growth ahead of them due to inflation, but they're still just hitting money back to you as the shareholder and you're able to utilize that however you want. So yeah, I think it's a, a pretty pretty good uh, pretty good company and good analysis right here to where you're really not too far off. So I'll try to do deeper a deeper dive shortly. But I hope you enjoy the video. Very